Hi guys, uh, good evening. Uh, can you all see me and hear me? So finally this class is happening. Uh, no, this class hasn't been postponed. It is there today itself. Uh, I hope I am visible and audible to you all. Mm. So this is the final part of the top 100 uh, images uh, which we've been having since the last week and finally it's ending now. So uh, seven parts. Uh, do revise this, uh, you know, and it will give you a good edge. Uh, for radiology as a subject uh, and uh, uh, this will take care of the most important topics also right so we've done all of these images in detail so uh, I mean you can just go through all of these as a revision uh, very quickly and then just follow it up with the revision classes we'll be having before the exam and that should take care of it uh, just to make sure you're doing previous year questions also for radiology and I think that should suffice okay uh, so for those of you who are new here I am uh, Zainab and I've done my MBBS and MD in radiology from Ames New Delhi uh, for an academy, this is the integrated and system wise batch course, which has started from 25th August, which has a bunch of uh, dual educator sessions as well. Uh, yeah, um, just keep, tell me if I am visible and audible to you. Huh? Okay, and uh, QBank 2.0 is also coming up uh, tomorrow. Yeah, so it's, it's launching tomorrow. So make sure that you are uh, um, checking it out. Uh, let's begin then with the 81st image. Yeah. All right. So tell me what this is. This is something which is very, very important in the last uh, NEET exam. Also, this image has figured the same image has figured in the last NEET exam. So what do you see anytime? See, the trick is anytime you have a hand X-ray and you have uh, all of these uh, lesions, you know, a bone tumor, basically expansi lesions you want to talk about in chondroma. Yes, an academy has launched a channel called uh, Desi Doctors Abroad for FMG students and you know students pursuing their MBBS abroad so that is what they have launched uh, as far as NEET PG goes yes yeah I, I look tired because I am tired it's quite late in the day yeah anyways uh, so but no we'll say it through with a lot of energy so what we have is anytime yes are all of you guessing it correct so this is uh, in chondroma so make sure that whenever there is a hand x-ray that is given to you uh, and you see multiple tumors, these are end chondromas. So what you want to look at, first of all, chondroma means there is chondroid matrix, like cartilaginous matrix. And that is described as this ring and arc stippled sort of calcifications. So this we call as ring and arc calcifications, all right. And you see that there are so many, so many of these uh, lesions, right. So there are two syndromes that you need to know as far as end chondromas are concerned. So whenever you see that there are only multiple end chondromas, only bone tumors. The syndrome that you want to talk about is all years syndrome, right? So, all years syndrome is when only multiple end chondromas. But in addition to multiple end chondromas, if you have multifocal hemangiomas, bluish lesions in the skin, and on the x ray, you, may, you might find these calcifications which are called as phlebolids, uh, you know. So, that syndrome is called as Mafuki syndrome. All right, so these are the two syndromes that you need to uh, do. Which checklist, Bhumi? The one that I had given for INICT strategy class. But that's like, that's too short. I mean, I had given that with respect to the last 15 days, right? So you can start off with that. And if time permits, you know, do some more topics also. So that is good for the last 15 days, but slightly more, you know, you need to do in this first cycle of revision. Okay, so these are the two syndromes as far as n chondromas are concerned. Again, talking on the lines of bone tumors, another one which is very important. So this is growing away from the bone, right? A mushroom-shaped tumor growing away from the bone. This is actually not considered a true bone tumor, but it's considered to be, uh, you know, a, a accident or an anomaly, basically not a true bone tumor. So this is osteochondroma. Means it has two parts. It has the bony part that you see on the X-ray and it has the cartilaginous part that you actually don't see on the X-ray, which is the cartilage cap. Yeah. Do I look so tired that so many of you are saying? I'm, I'm not that tired. I mean, I'm just thoda tired. So, osteochondroma. Yeah. So, this is the bone and you can see that there's a mushroom shaped out pouching with uh, this, right? With this cap here that you see, which is a cartilaginous cap, all right? So, this cartilage cap is extremely important to be visualized. Why? So, why are we doing this MRI here to see cartilage cap when, you know, your diagnosis is pretty clear on the x-ray itself. So, then why are we um, doing the MRI? 
because the cartilage cap thickness is very important because these patients are going to develop chondrosarcoma right so remember they are at a risk of developing chondrosarcoma and to pick up this chondrosarcoma we basically want to measure the thickness of this cap right so we're going to be doing an mri and we measure the maximum thickness of this cartilage cap if it is more than 1.5 centimeters yeah so that is taken as a chondrosarcoma and this patient um, will be uh, undergoing surgery so the treatment is going to be extra periosteal resection of this particular exostosis right so we want to remove it if the cap is more than 1.5 centimeters thick okay so this is about osteochondroma and basically because of its risk of chondrosarcoma it is very very important all right uh, apart from this again this can also be uh, multiple which we call as HME which is hereditary multiple exostosis so the other name of this tumor is exostosis because it is growing outwards HME uh, this is also called as a misnomer which is diaphyseal aclasis the importance is now these patients who have multiple enchondromas God, we have so it's okay, guys. We have so uh, we have so many tumors. We'll have a higher risk of malignancy. So the here the risk of malignancy is five to twenty percent, whereas in a single case the risk is around one percent. Yeah, so the risk of malignancy is five to twenty times higher in cases of hereditary multiple exostosis or diaphyseal eclasis. Okay, understood, guys. So this is about uh, exostosis or osteochondroma. One of you asked that uh, enchondroma in brown tumors. See, brown tumors are something that you will not see in the, uh, you know, the hand short tubular bones per se. They're more commonly seen around metaphyses of the long bones, right? So the radius, ulna, the long bones will have that, okay? Then you don't need treatment. Um, Dr. Kiru, we just want to follow these patients up. If it is less than 1.5, you just follow these patients up. Only if it becomes more than 1.5, you have a risk of malignancy and you want to operate. Otherwise, just follow these patients up. Okay? Right. What about this? This is, uh, again, last year INICT question. And somehow INICT in recent times has been obsessed uh, with uh, diaphragm pathologies for certain reason. Every exam, you're getting one odd question, you know, from this. This is very, very important. So, what are you seeing here? Yes, please don't look at my eyes. Look at the image and tell me what you see. Gas under diaphragm. So, is gas under the left diaphragm normal? Can this be the fundus of the stomach? Yeah, this is normal, no, on the left side. If I see this on the right side, I'm worried for pneumoperitoneum. On the left side, this is just the fundus, right? So, what are you seeing? Is there a difference in the diaphragm? Yeah, can you see how the left diaphragm is very much raised? Yes. So, if I tell you that this person has history of trauma, if I give you history of trauma, what is the consideration that you're going to make now? Yes. So, then it means that this diaphragm has been pushed up likely because of a diaphragm injury, likely because of a diaphragm tear. Right. So, here the diagnosis is going to be diaphragm injury in context of trauma. Yes. Thank you so much, guys, <laughs> for understanding so much just on the basis of my face and being so kind. Thank you very much. So, history of trauma. This is diaphragm injury. The question which had come was, what is the... Uh, procedure or intervention which is contraindicated in this condition right so they had given you a bunch of options like icd insertion ng tube and something like uh, iv fluids you know so two were obviously wrong which you will do in all cases one was icd one was ng tube what do you not want to do in this case okay bag and mask i'll give you bag and mask do you want to bag and mask this patient if the patient is uh, having respiratory distress yes you can this is not something which is like a congenital diaphragmatic hernia in diaphragmatic hernia the problem was that already you are having pulmonary hypoplasia you don't want further inflation of the bowel loops right here we don't have that problem here the problem would be if you put in an icd why would you put in an icd because we have a tendency that anytime I see this sort of a horizontal fluid, which is in the thorax, I'm going to consider a hydropneumothorax and you might inadvertently put in an ICD, which is not the right thing because now you're perforating the stomach. You're putting the ICD in the stomach. This is not hydropneumothorax. So the key is to look at the CP angle. Do you see this? That the CP angle is actually sharp. The CP angle is not blunted. If this was indeed hydropneumothorax, 
how would it appear look at this so now you would see that okay there is this air fluid level but it is above the thorax it is this cp angle which is blunted so there is fluid below air above so this is air fluid level of hydropneumothorax while this is normal stomach isn't it so this is a case of diaphragm tear and remember contraindication would be icd because you don't want to misinterpret it with a hydropneumothorax did everybody get my point because in the exam it will be your first instinct to mark this as a hydropneumothorax right so always look out if it's below the diaphragm or above the diaphragm right so in this case it's going to be this we cannot distinguish between what kind of a tear it is just looking at this image more commonly it is posterior tear which is more common dr brunal but looking at the image we cannot see right so this is about that for any sort of a diaphragmatic tear remember non invasive investigation of choice if asked you want to go for cct but what is the gold standard something that can visualize all the tears and it can treat or uh, treat it also it's going to be diagnostic laparoscopy right so you want to go ahead with a dl we call it a dl which is a diagnostic laparoscopy which is the investigation of choice the best investigation for uh, diaphragm injury okay so this is about a ct and a dl which are the best investigations okay do you know any triad for diaphragm injury guys do you know any triad there's one triad called bergquist triad no bergquist triad which is very random actually it has i mean no sense as such so here you have diaphragm injury you have rib fracture you have pelvic fracture and you can sometimes also have spine fracture yeah so it's just a bunch of injuries thrown together and you've made a triad but you know such questions can come so this is diaphragm injury okay right so this we have already done so have you guys understood the difference where do we look for the air fluid level so this is hydro pneumothorax where you have this large air fluid level but the cp angle is blunted right it's not sharp like this normal cp angle okay thank you so much dr banveer for being so kind what is this this is a hysterosalpingography so we've put in a catheter but instead of seeing a normal uterus two tubes and spill i'm only seeing one uh, banana shaped horn of uterus i'm only seeing one fallopian tube which is actually spilling out so what is this this is obviously a unicornuate uterus right so this is unicornuate uterus remember in the exam you out of all the mullerian anomalies they can either ask you unicornuate or they can ask you diadelphus so i'll just show you a brief schematic and it'll become very simple because otherwise this is a topic which is more difficult uh, i mean more it is easier than it is made out to be right so it is uh, it is it feels difficult but it is easy yeah so in mullerian anomalies you have a bunch of mullerian anomalies so one the easiest unicornuate <coughs> only one horn right so this is unicornuate diadelphus you will have completely divergent two horns what is the problem with diadelphus the problem with diadelphus is there are two horns which have not fused at all dono apne apne paranasonephric ducts are lying dono mullerian ducts are lying independently they have not fused unicornuate one duct only did not form right so this will also have yes as pt is saying higher risk of renal agenesis also so this is diadelphus now the problem comes when you have partially fused when you have a heart there are always problems right so remember whenever the uterus appears like a heart then it can be two things which you can not distinguish on hsg these are all hsg schematics that i am making so here i have two differentials one is septate other is bicornuate now do we have subtle things like the distance being more than 4 cm the angle being more than 75 degree that favors bicornuate yes but are they reliable no they are not reliable right so septate versus bicornuate can we distinguish on hsg no that is why all of you in the last neat exam whoever had attempted last neat exam they had given you one heart shaped hsg and they had asked is this septate is this bicornuate so obviously you cannot say on the hsg and that is why in the result you had that all right there are these three questions where we, we were wrong the question was likely wrong and i feel that was one of them right so remember that septate versus bicornuate is something we cannot distinguish on hsg how do you distinguish so we can distinguish on the investigation of choice which could be 3d ultrasound or mri so if 
the outer contour is smooth and then you have a heart it is septate but if outer contour is also hard and this is also hard it is bicornuate okay so that is how we distinguish understood everybody apart from that what are the other hsgs which can come one is mrkh which you will not be asked as an hsg because there you have complete absence only of the uterus right so that will not be asked bus baki t shaped uterus we never ever see so that will also never come but t shaped uterus is because of ds fine so this is your mullerian anomalies in a nutshell okay some anatomy for you so this is a normal uh, mediastinal cct right cct because bones are white contrast is white now i'll be just look at a few anatomical structures here so this is the plane of bifurcation first of all do you see how trachea has bifurcated into two carina arch has bifurcated into ascending and descending aorta main pulmonary artery has bifurcated into right and left pulmonary artery so what vertebral plane should this be the plane of bifurcation where you have the angle of lui also this is your d4 d5 vertebral level yeah thoracic 4 thoracic 5 d4 d5 or t4 t5 vertebral level so what are the structures you want to remember this is the plane of sac so from right to left i'm sure all of you know this is right this is left from right to left we have three vessels sabse right mein sa svc this main one ascending aorta and then msa main pulmonary artery so three vessels svc ascending aorta main pulmonary artery you can see how mp is dividing into right and left the so trachea has bifurcated into right and left main stem bronchus and this behind is the descending aorta and here you have a chota sa collapsible esophagus okay so this is what you have in this plane easy right so just remember sam and if they ask you such a question about what vertebral level is this or same level pe they give you cadaveric section easy peasy right we just remember sam and our answer becomes very very clear theek hai to anatomy bhi ho gaya again very easy something we all need right now is a coffee a pick me up which is this in form of an x ray so this is coffee bean sign right so whenever you see this coffee bean sign what is the diagnosis sigmoid volvulus yeah so whenever you can remember this as whenever you drink too much coffee you will have constipation and constipation is the risk factor of sigmoid volvulus i wonder how i could not come up with this earlier okay so you can remember like this the risk factor is constipation in elderly patients which leads to sigmoid volvulus fine so this is coffee bean sign okay so here the one differential that you know you want to consider is how do you distinguish it from a sickle volvulus right so there are two bowel loops which can undergo volvulus twisting upon itself sigmoid volvulus sickle volvulus now any time you see two tubes one tube and two tubes i mean this is one loop this is second loop that is a sigmoid volvulus so first see how many loops two loops hai to sigmoid agar one loop hai sickle sickle volvulus will appear something like this a singular loop all right so apart from that do you see any hostrations here no hostrations right so there are no hostrations very very straight bowel loop so if there are no hostrations sigmoid volvulus sickle volvulus will have hostrations okay and the third important point look at the bowel loops which are dilated in sigmoid volvulus obviously you will have the large bowel loops which are going up upstream dilatation so large bowel loops will be dilated in sickle volvulus you will have the upstream small bowel loops which are dilated right so these are the three most reliable features baki kahan pe axis hai clockwise hai anti clockwise hai that is not reliable okay so remember these three will help you distinguish sigmoid versus sickle volvulus how do you treat sigmoid volvulus it is just conservative put in a flattest tube and there'll be detorsion so this is also called as endoscopic detorsion whereas for sickle volvulus this is going to need surgical detorsion all right so this is how we are going to distinguish both of these entities all right so this is about sigmoid volvulus two metaphyseal bone tumors so we've been discussing a lot of bone tumors two more for you so these are in the metaphyses can we comment on the age of these children yeah so you can see how the epiphyses has not fused with the metaphyses epiphyses has not fused with the metaphyses so i can at least say that less than 
18 years, right? I don't have an image of cecal volvulus, but it looks exactly like this. You'll see a dilated bubble loop with frustrations, right? In the midline, you will not be asked to diagnose a cecal volvulus in the exam, okay? I don't think they'll ask you that. So, this is a child, right? Less than 18 to 19 years is what I can say for sure. Now, here you have a metaphyseal tumor which is very homogeneous. There are no septations. It is very much in the center. And you see a typical sign here where there is a fracture and the fragment is floating here. So this is called as the fallen leaf sign which is seen in a simple bone cyst or a unicameral bone cyst. On the other hand, a metaphyseal lesion with multifocal septation. Yeah, this is seen in an aneurysmal bone cyst. So when you have septations, this is going to be slightly more eccentric while an SBC is going to be a central lesion. All right. So this is how we distinguish SBC versus ABC. Why does ABC have so many septations? Because this is aneurysmal bone cyst, right? So you're going to have a lot of blood here. So if you do an MRI, you are going to see the blood fluid levels here. Okay, so remember that there is blood here and if asked, what is the closest variant of a GCT? This is also a repeat question. Closest variant of GCT is indeed aneurysmal bone cyst. Okay, because GCT also we have seen distal end of radius in one of the very early classes of this top 100 series. We are going to be seeing uh, same septations. We are also going to be seeing blood fluid levels yeah so as i am saying dr reha so fluid fluid levels or blood fluid levels do you want to make a list for that so what are all the lesions where you have fluid fluid or blood fluid levels which means that which have hemorrhage so do to humne kar liye abc ho gaya gct ho gaya which are variant variant of one another then there is one variant of osteosarcoma which is telangiectatic osteosarcoma and the third fourth one is when you have metastasis from very vascular primaries right so you can have clear cell rcc you can have choriocarcinoma follicular ca thyroid all of these are very vascular so all of these will have fluid fluid levels in orthopedics you will see the same list as the clinical presentation of pulsatile bony lesions so if you have a bone lesion which is pulsating because it has so much blood so much vascularity again the same differentials are gonna come into picture okay is this clear everybody so we've discussed sbc and abc treatment simple bone cyst simple curettage aneurysmal bone cyst extended curettage and grafting okay so this is the treatment also going on to this what is the angle being measured one year back they were obsessed with scoliosis everybody was asking scoliosis in every exam somehow now it's not coming since the last one year so scoliosis, the angle being measured is the Cobb's angle. So you're going to see this lateral curvature of the spine and you're seeing that there is this angle which is being measured for the curvature, which is called as Cobb's angle. So scoliosis is defined as an angle of deviation, which is more than 10 degrees, right? So when the Cobb's angle is more than 10, that is when we define scoliosis. Scoliosis can be postural or it could be the true scoliosis, right? So how do you distinguish it from postural scoliosis? By doing a clinical test, which is called as a forward bending test by the name of Adam, right? So Adam's forward bending test. So you would be given an image-based question here where somebody is bending forward and they would ask you, what is this a screening test for? So you have to say it's a screen to test for postural scoliosis, which would correct when the person bends down. Right, so this is about that. Within true scoliosis, what is the most common type? So it's always going to be idiopathic scoliosis, which is most common. It's going to be most commonly seen in adolescents, right? So that is something which is about true scoliosis. All right, so these are all the questions that can come. Treatment wise, when do you want to operate these patients? So anytime you have severe scoliosis, more than 40 degree Cobb's angle, or you have something called as a riser index which means the skeletal maturity index. If this is low, if riser index is low, means that the person will still grow, the scoliosis will worsen, so the operation needs to be done. So either riser index is low or the Cobb's angle is high in which we want to operate. Otherwise, you can give braces to these patients. Can you name a few braces, guys, which also come as image-based question for scoliosis? So we've gone into 
four ortho now. So one which always comes is after a name of a city. Yeah, so you have a few uh, braces here. So you need to know one, yes, Milwaukee brace, which is very, very important. The other one, again, a name of a town, Boston brace. And then there is one more, which is called as Charleston brace, right? So all of these are braces that you need to know. If you see some sort of, I mean, metallic things, that's the Milwaukee. In the exam, if you don't know, mark Milwaukee brace. Okay, Charleston will come as this tube top sort of a uh, thing and Boston brace is somewhere in the middle. All right, so you have these three braces that you need to know. So this is all about scoliosis in short, but the question usually comes, ki, what is the angle being measured? Yeah, so this is Cobb's angle. Okay, going on to a pelvic MRI. Score values in riser. So somewhere around any riser which is less than three basically is what we say. You mean SOMI, Pushpa, huh? uh, sterno-occipital mandibular immobilization brace, SOMI brace. That is for trauma. Right? SOMI brace is for trauma and for spine stabilization basically. It is not for scoliosis. Okay? Yeah, this is indeed an MRI of the uterus. You can see this is the bladder, a T2 weighted image, a sagittal image. This is the spine and the uterus is very much enlarged. Is this symmetrically enlarged? Yeah, so you can see that the shape of the uterus per se is maintained, right? So symmetrically enlarged. So this is called as symmetrically bulky uterus. Anytime this is the clinical presentation, symmetrically bulky tender uterus, always, always you want to consider adenomyosis. But if they say non-tender asymmetrical enlargement of the uterus, consider leomyomas, right? So in adenomyosis, what happens? You have the presence of endometrial glands and stroma in the junctional zone, right? In the myometrium. So that is what you are seeing. Can you see these white, white dots? So this is the endometrial glands which are now present within the myometrium, within the junctional zone, okay? So this is defined as adenomyosis and this has been referred to as a salt and pepper sign, okay? Similar thing when you see on an ultrasound, no? you will see a lot of shadowing which is coming from these glands. So that is also called as a Venetian blind appearance. All right. So there are two named signs. The question will come as this same, uh, you know, clinical presentation that there is a lot of chronic pelvic pain on examination. There is symmetrical enlargement of the uterus and they can also give you that there is tenderness, yeah, which is present. So this is about adenomyosis. See, it can be on both sides or it can be on one side. So this is not the point. The symmetrical enlargement means that the outer contour of the uterus is not distorted. Yeah, in a leomyoma, you would have some sort of bulge asymmetrically. So because the pathology here is in the junctional zone, there is no way that the outer contour would be deformed, right? Because I can't palpate here. I can only palpate the outer contour, which will be smooth. Understood? Yeah. So, this is about adenomyosis. Yes, this is asymmetrical. This can involve one junctional zone. It's not necessary ki SA junctional zone involve hoga. Okay. Understood? So, this is adenomyosis. One more endometrial lesion, but now I'm showing you a transvaginal ultrasound. When you see the uterus very big here, no bladder anteriorly, this is a transvaginal sonography. This is the myometrium, right? So, outer mein jo hypoechoic hai, this is the myometrium. And this central part is the endometrium. So within the endometrium, you can see that there is a Doppler which is showing you a vessel. So this is called as a feeding vessel sign, which is a sign of very nice endometrial polyp. So this is how an endometrial polyp appears. It is hyper echoic. It's very white and you will see a fibrovascular stalk within the polyp because polyp kya hai? It has a stalk and then it is polyp right it's hanging so this is basically the feeding vessel sign that you see on doppler one more interesting point that can come in the exam is we can do a type of ultrasound which is called as saline infusion sonography so right now we basically have a very can you see how there is a very white hyperechoic endometrium this is how normally endometrium appears so how do i know if polyp is there or not so if this is the uterus and this is the endometrial cavity, if I put black, black saline inside it, ultrasound may saline will appear black, right? 
I will see that a polyp will now start to float. I will see it surrounded by this fluid. Okay. So remember this saline infusion sonography has a role in diagnosing endometrial polyp as well as a submucosal fibroid. These are two lesions which can be best picked up by SIS saline infusion sonography. Okay. So this is about polyp. Now I have three signs for you which all have the word empty in them. Three things which are empty. So when I tell you this pituitary, you do not see pituitary but you only see water, you only see CSF and you see this stalk here, right? So where is the pituitary? It has undergone atrophy, maybe because of a postpartum hemorrhage, the female developed ischemic necrosis and the pituitary has undergone ischemic necrosis followed by atrophy. What am I talking about? Yes. So this is empty cella, which can be seen with what syndrome that I just described? Sheehan, right? So this is something that can be seen in Sheehan syndrome. It can also be seen if there is ischemic necrosis of the pituitary, following trauma, following radiotherapy, you can see an empty cella syndrome. Can I see this in apoplexy though? What is apoplexy? Apoplexy is when you have an adenoma within the pituitary which undergoes hemorrhage. So remember it will not present as empty cella. You will see that there is a T1 hyperintensity within a large adenoma. That is apoplexy. So remember, these are two very different things. Here hemorrhage happens, here ischemic necrosis happens, okay? So that is the difference. The second one is an old AIMS repeat question. That is why I wanted to discuss because now the trend is old AIMS questions are coming back in the exam, right? So make sure you have that in mind. So here, this is the appearance of a normal thecal sac. Do you see this is the vertebra and within the thecal sac at the level of phylum terminal, you have all of these nerve roots. What happened here though? You can see that there are no nerve roots only which are seen. Yeah, I'll just zoom. Can you see? Uh, again, I'll just erase and show you. So this is how a normal thecal sac at the level of phylum terminal appears. You have all of these nerve roots, right? Whereas here, kuch dikhi nahi ra. So this is called as empty thecal sac sign. Yeah, so this is called as an empty thecal sac sign which is seen in arachnoiditis when there is inflammation here. Arachnoiditis, it usually results after a surgery. Yeah, post-operative there is inflammation, there is infection, arachnoiditis. All of the thecal sac roots will basically disappear. Can you see now guys? Yeah, so this is normal roots. These are normal roots. Can you see any roots here? No, because they are all adhered here. Hai na? Inflammation hoga to usko stick kar jayenge. They are all adhered here and that is why we see an empty thecal sac sign. Yes, I hope everybody could see it now. Finally, one empty that I am sure all of you guys know. When you do a CCT and the superior sagittal sinus, the triangle is not showing you enhancement. Can you see how normally it should have been white on a CCT? But now I am seeing that there is a filling defect. This is an empty delta sign which is seen in superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. Yeah, so this is seen in superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. So, three empties together so that you can remember empty cella, remember any sort of ischemic insult different from apoplexy, empty thecal sac, repeat AIMS question, empty delta sign, superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. No. Empty thickal sac sign will not be seen on NCCT. What will you see on NCCT? On NCCT, the acute thrombus will actually appear white. If it's NCCT, the thrombus appears hyperdense. If it's a CCT, it appears as a filling defect. Okay. So here we call it the cord sign or you can also call it just delta. Don't call it empty delta because now delta is full, right, with white thrombus. So then you use the term delta sign and cord sign, which is slightly confusing, isn't it? But remember the standard CCT, we will see empty delta because the thrombus is a filling defect. NCCT thrombus itself is white. So we call it delta sign or cord sign. Okay, I hope I made myself clear there. Easy, tell me what bone tumor is this? Today's theme seems to be bone tumors. So the epicenter is metaphysis. We can see how it's white. 
yeah it is white means there is bone forming tumor there is an osteogenic tumor and you see it's very aggressive it is going beyond the cortex there is the sunburst periosteal reaction seeing the periosteum is lifted which is called as codman's triangle not codman's tumor though what is the codman's tumor that is chondroblastoma remember it's also called as codman's tumor so this is codman's triangle you are also seeing a sunburst periosteal reaction this is because of tumor growing along the blood vessels you are seeing a sclerotic white matrix so this is your typical osteosarcoma osteosarcoma is the most radio resistant bone tumor yes this has a bimodal distribution it can be seen in 0 to 20 years and it can be seen in elderly because of certain risk factors like radiotherapy paget disease you can have secondary osteosarcoma as well right but seen rt is a risk factor for osteosarcoma but is osteosarcoma responsive to radiotherapy no it is the most radio resistant radio uh, bone tumor okay so ye is a irony ko yaad rakho okay so this is about osteosarcoma fine okay next we have an mrcp mrcp image magnetic resonance cholangiopancreaticography yes and what do you see within the hepatic ducts there are all of these tiny tiny strictures right multifocal strictures giving rise right to this beaded sort of an appearance very nice so we are seeing this beading this beaded sort of appearance this is p s c which is primary sclerosing cholangitis this is going to present with obstructive jaundice this these patients need to be monitored because they have high risk of developing cholangiocarcinoma right apart from this i also want you to remember its association with inflammatory bowel disease right so 70% cases are associated with inflammatory bowel disease more common with ulcerative colitis the confusion between pbc and psc is something which is very easily solvable clinically so primary biliary cirrhosis is an autoimmune condition which would be more common in young women history mein kya diya hoga you will have history mein very typical markers in the question like these fatty depositions on the eye i am just showing where they are i don't have them so it is xanthelasmas which will be their fatty depositions here as a picture ban ke aata hai then you can also have osteopenia here and the hallmark would be the antibody that they give you here which are going to be the anti mitochondrial antibodies right so ama is something which will be your key here on the other hand primary sclerosing cholangitis because of its association with uc you will see p anka a typical p anka which can be associated with psc and rest of the features will be very different apart from this radiopath रेडियोलॉजिकली क्या डिफरेंस होगा तो ये तो हमने क्लिनिकल बता दिया रेडियोलॉजिकली द डिफरेंस वुड बी पी एस सी विल शो यू दिस बीडेड सॉर्ट ऑफ एन अपियरेंस इन प्राइमरी बिलियरी सीरोस यू वुड सी जस्ट पेरीफेरल प्रूनिंग पेरीफरी में जाके द डक्स बिकम वेरी मच नैरोड विच इज नेवर आज टू यू एज एन इमेज बेस्ड क्वेश्चन सो इमेज पूछा है तो पी एस सी ही है उसके अलावा हाँ यस पुष्पा आई मस्ट ओनली टोल दैट ओके सो पेरीफेरल प्रूनिंग इज पी बी सी बट कैन दे आस्क यू पैथ क्वेश्चन येस सो पैथ में क्या हॉलमार्क है इन प्राइमरी स्क्लीरोजिंग कॉलेंजाइटिस यूर गन हैव अ लॉट ऑफ दिस फाइब्रोटिक लीजन यू गन हैव दिस अनियन स्किनिंग वेर इज इन प्राइमरी बिलियरी सीरोसिस यू विल हैव दिस फ्लोरिड लीजन विच आर गन शो यू इन्फिल्ट्रेशन ऑफ प्लाज्मा सेल्स ओके तो ये पैथ में भी पढ़ लेना सो दैट इज द डिफरेंस बेसिकली बिटवीन पी बी सी एंड पी एस सी बट दिस क्लिनिकल इन यू एस एम एल एटलीस्ट दे लव टू आस्क यू दिस जैनथेलेजमो ऑस्टियोपीनिया एंड ए एम ए फॉर पी बी सी ओके राइट सो दिस इज अबाउट प्राइमरी स्पीरोजिंग कॉलेजाइटिस ओके लास्ट थिंग नाइनटी फिफ्थ वी हैव वॉट इज दिस डिवाइस गाइज एनी टाइम यू सी दिस शॉर्ट ऑफ अ जेनरेटर यू वॉन्ट अ थिंक ऑफ पेस मेकर एंड डिफिब्रिलेटर तो क्या देखेंगे वी लुक एट द पेरीफेरल लीड इफ यू सी के छोटा 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 लीड है इट इज अ पेस मेकर इफ यू सी दैट दर इज अ बिग शॉक कॉइल देन इट्स अ डिफिब्रिलेटर राइट सो नेम इज बिग 
implantable cardioverter defibrillator so it have a big shocker but when you have these chotu chotu it is pacemaker in fmg you had a question ki batao ye pacemaker kaun se chamber mein hai so then you have to see what kind of a pacemaker it is if you see only one lead only one lead then it is either in ra or rv so they will not ask you that if you see two leads like this case which is the most common one ek yahan pe hai ek yahan pe hai this is in ra this is in rv okay so dual chamber ra plus rv if you see a biventricular or a three chamber lead then the third one is going to be in left ventricle understood so when they ask you such a question if there are two leads one is in right atrium one is in right ventricle you see where the arrow is pointed and we mark accordingly so these are the types of pacemakers also is this understood everybody so this is about pacemaker diagnosis combined dono ko mila ke last four to go so this is sickle cell anemia so what do you see on the skull x ray you have this hair on end appearance also called as a crow cut appearance and here so you can have all the dds of any hemolytic anemia but when you see that the vertebrae also are showing you this typical h shaped vertebrae there are these infarcts in the central part of the end plates which is called as h shaped vertebra this is only seen in sickle cell anemia because you have microvascular occlusion right so sickle cell anemia you can see this you can see h shaped vertebra you can also see multifocal bone infarcts right so remember a few differentials when you have a lot of multiple bone infarcts you want to consider sickle cell anemia you want to consider alcoholic patient you want to rule out steroids in this patient right so all of these are differentials that you want for a multi focal bone in facts apart from that do you know something called as kazon's disease jo decompression sickness hota hai that can also have multiple bone in facts okay fish mouth is going to be like this like this okay so basically in fish mouth what is happening the entire end plate is depressed entire end plate is depressed because of axial loading jabki yahan pe kya ho raha hai only the central part of the bone the central part is having these microvascular occlusion and infarcts so that is the difference okay baki history ye bachcha hoga multiple bony crises ye sab diya hoga whereas this will be an elderly post menopausal female with back pain na to completely different okay and <laughs> what do you see here so you were seeing neuro na nikhil so now you tell me what is this what do you see on this skull x ray we are having this calcification which is called as tram track calcification so tram track calcification you are seeing in yes very nice messerby so this is sturge weber syndrome so sturge weber syndrome is a neurocutaneous syndrome remember this is not inherited this is s for sporadic all right and the triad of sturge weber syndrome so you will have a port wine stain a facial nevus right which is of wine color purplish color port wine stain most commonly in the trigeminal territory that to along v1 the second thing you will have is congenital glaucoma and the third thing is unilateral cortical atrophy so one side of the brain will undergo atrophy and because of that you can have refractory seizures yes you can have refractory seizures because of that so this is the triad of sturge weber syndrome Okay, so remember this skull appearance, tram track calcification. Ninety-eight. You have an old patient who complains of an acute pain at the first metatarsophalangeal joint, and you see that there are these large rat bite erosions with overhanging margins. So the moment you see first MTP diagnosis is pretty clear. We are dealing with a case of gout. We are going to have deposition of mono sodium. urate crystals yeah and this sign is called as martel g sign wherein you have these large rat bite erosions with overhanging margins the investigation of choice is going to be to do a aspiration and analyze the crystals that is when you can actually distinguish it from pseudo gout what is pseudo gout pseudo gout is when you have calcium pyrophosphate deposition this occurs in elderly patient most commonly in the 
knee joint. All right. How do you distinguish on needle aspiration? So monosodium urate are going to be needle shaped crystals which are NE sehi negatively biofringent on polarizing microscopy. Here these are going to be rhomboid shape. Right. So my rhomboid and needle actually look same but this is going to be weakly positive. Yeah, so rhomboid and weakly positive. How pseudo gout is going to present is it's going to have calcification of cartilage, chondrocalcinosis. So we can have meniscal calcification, which is noted here in pseudo gout. In pseudo gout, remember always you want to rule out hypothyroidism, you want to rule out hyperparathyroidism, you want to rule out hemochromatosis. So all H's you want to rule out here. Okay, hemochromatosis in particular. So this is about gout versus pseudo gout. All right. Here you have MSU monosodium urate. Here you have calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease. Okay. Penultimate 99th image. You have a brain tumor. The most common benign brain tumor that you have which has this dural tail. You see this tail. This is the most common benign brain tumor in adults. This is meningioma more common in females this increases in size in pregnancy because it has pr receptors progesterone receptors and progesterone increases in pregnancy then radiologically what we see we're gonna see neural tail sign if we do a ct the typical feature is the presence of calcification here and you can also see bony expansion called hyperostosis Yes, if we do a DSA, which we never do for a diagnosis of meningioma, but there is just this one very typical sign because it's so unique. So this is mother-in-law sign, wherein the enhancement, the contrast comes in very early and it live, leaves late, right? So basically that is likened to a mother-in-law. Somebody is putting so much thought into this sign. So contrast comes in early and goes late. So this is a very vascular tumor basically, right? So these are all the signs. Histopath wise, you're going to be seeing Samoma bodies here and you will see a typical bold, bold sort of an appearance. Okay, so this is about meningioma and what else was I saying? WHO grade, so normally this is grade 1 but you can also have atypical meningiomas. Okay, last image, last image. What do we have? We have an MRI coronal image. So these are the two kidneys and these are the psoas muscles. So within the right psoas, can you see how there are these hyper intense lesions here? So this is psoas abscess, right? So this is a psoas abscess within the psoas muscle. Somehow last year, again, they were obsessed with psoas. In every exam, either anatomically psoas pooch lete the, the psoas abscess pooch lete the, the psoas ka insertion pooch lete the. So insertion of psoas is going to be at lesser trochanter, right? So LT ka x-ray they can put sakte maa pe kya insert ho rai. So ilio psoas, all right? So this is about psoas abscess. This can be primary, I mean, because of bacterial or it can be associated with pot spine also. So if the spine appears normal, it is because of primary psoas abscess. But when you have a pot, abs, pot spine here, it is because of pot spine, okay? All right, guys. So I think that's it. <laughs> Finally, we can uh, say that this series has ended. Uh, so thank you so much. And do revise these 100 images. And hopefully you will get all your questions from this is my sincere hope. But obviously, this is not the last time that we are revising radiology. We'll be meeting again for sure on a daily basis only we meet. But for radiology, we meet rarely. But uh, we'll definitely revise images again. Okay. So we'll be resuming with uh, must know topics uh, day after tomorrow. Okay. Not tomorrow, day after tomorrow. Uh, one question Corpus callosum lipoma. There is no corpus callosum at this level. No, you're only seeing the brain. So corpus callosum lipoma, first of all, you'll see a typical CT image with a very hypodense, uh, this thing, right? A very hypodense lesion at the midline. I'll maybe post a picture of corpus callosum lipoma. It's very different, okay? Thank you so much for my handwriting uh, being nice comment. Uh, this, I do not get it very often, so I'm very grateful for it. I will post this annotated PDF on the group for sure. I'll be post for doing it. Uh, all right, guys. So thank you so much. And I will see you all very soon. 
uh, uh, telegram is radiology with zenobora it's a public group you can join it okay and all right thank you so much you can do prep rr also or you can do this series anything is fine i am same person no i'm so i mean content slightly different eh? but uh, i stress on the same things in you know everywhere right so whatever resource you have you can follow okay all right guys thank you so much and uh, nkt will resume day after tomorrow we'll have ballistics next then we have csa weeks and then we have embryology three classes back to back this weekend okay all right guys thank you so much and bye good night